Well, hello and welcome to Coffee with TMEs. I'm Jeff McLaughlin, Director of Technical Marketing here at Cisco. And uh, today we're going to be talking about configuration compliance with Cisco DNA Center. And I have a special guest with me today, Pavan Siripuram, uh, out of Bangalore. And uh, Pavan, welcome. And why don't you tell the uh, listeners a little bit about uh, your background and uh, how you got to where you are today. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Pawan Siripuram. I work as a technical marketing engineer for Cisco DNA Center, uh, predominantly in automation space I work around. I've started as a tech engineer in Cisco, and today I'm working as a TME uh, in the uh, Cisco DNA Center automation space. Uh, well, that's it from my side, Jeff. Tech. Well, I uh, I can really appreciate that. I worked in tech for two years, and uh, I know what that's like. It's a tough job, yeah. but you you learn a lot, yes, right? Yes, yes, that's true. Yeah, fun fun years. So, and and uh, this is coffee with TMEs. Do you have coffee or no, uh, tea or something? Uh, so it's pretty late. Oh, yeah, so. no coffee. Yeah. It's late for you. Yeah, you don't want coffee because yes. you're about to go yes, to sleep, yeah, right? That's right. That's right. It's the morning for yes. us, so we can have it. All yeah. right. Well, I've got my coffee. Yeah. So. Um, I, you know, so today we're talking about configuration compliance, and I, I had kind of a funny story uh, that goes back to my TAC days, actually. So uh, back when I worked in TAC, uh, so I actually had a customer that opened a case because they had a multi-link PPP bundle. So that was multiple circuits mm -hmm. in a PPP bundle, and it wasn't working. And they had RMA'd the, uh, the line cards in this chassis. They had RMA'd the router itself. It was, it was a 7507 router, so a huge you know, chassis to go you know, pull out of the rack and you know, put in a new one. And I started looking through the case and I ran some debugs and I saw that PPP was failing because of authorization problems. Mm -hmm. And I, I realized it was a configuration issue. You know, they had done yeah. all these RMAs for nothing, yeah, right? Yeah, And so uh, I, I found one line in the config that said AAA, uh, that set the, the AAA network authorization default mm -hmm. uh, to local, mm -hmm. which meant that by default it was trying to authorize this line and, and, and authorize the, the PPP, excuse me. And uh, what was interesting was it was at the global level of the config, so it was kind of hard to see. It wasn't under the interface. It was a global thing. Mm -hmm. And so we took that command off. Everything came back okay. up. You know, I was the hero. <laughs> and uh, in one of those great tack cases where it comes in, you think, oh, man, they've done five RMAs yeah. on this. It's, it's, no, it's terrible. But... Um, it ended up being, you know, really easy. But the interesting thing was that the customer said they had done a configuration standardization project, uh -huh. and they had tried to standardize the configs across all of their devices, and they didn't realize as they did it that they had copied and pasted this one line from one of their routers somewhere where it probably didn't have any effect, mm -hmm. and they copied and pasted it to a bunch of the routers on their network. Mm -hmm. Um, so this was a long time ago, but that's kind of a configuration compliance thing. I mean, they were trying to make sure all their network devices had the same configuration yep. and that they weren't out of config. In this case, it caused them a bit of a problem, but it just made me think that this has been an issue for a long time. Mm -hmm. And so I know, I, I know, Pavan, that, um, you know, the idea behind configuration compliance can be stuff like security compliance, for example. Maybe we want to make sure you know, that management interfaces of devices are restricted mm -hmm. and uh, maybe we want certain types of, of um, authentication or authorization into a network device. But uh, is that that's how it used to be back then? Is it the same thing now or are there different uh, motivations for people to do configuration compliance? Like what's the interest in it? I see the story. Uh, so you, you were on the right one spot, uh, Jeff, if you ask me, like, yeah, that's that's how it's been started, like uh, to start with. So everyone looks into the CLIs and see like, okay, they use, usually have a standard configuration and they will compare it and see like, okay, my network is running the standard configuration or not. That's how it used to be. Uh, but as with the distribution, everything has been changed. And with the DNS center, the whole game has been changed because now we are talking about the intent. So when the intent comes to the picture, so intent, it's nothing but it's more like a golden configuration where actual customer wants to have the context to be like, uh, for example, just to give some small example, like, uh, for example, if you take any QoS or something. So if you are configuring using the DNS center and you have some intent sort of stuff, then you want to make sure like that intent is intact, meaning like no user goes to the CLA or the same example about the AAA. If you are using the DNS center to configure the AAA and mm -hmm. you go to the CLA and you change something, then you shouldn't be going to the devices or going to different, different places, like uh, go to different network engineer and ask like who did this change and all those things. So what we are bringing up is like, we are bringing up a single box solution where you should be in a position to go to the DNS center and see like what are the changes have been done and what are all the out of band changes, like who logged into actually the CLI and did those changes 
and whether those state changes have been saved or is there any deviation from the intent. So that's what we are talking about here. It's it's not more like the box by box, like which you used to do it. So in short, like, uh, yeah, go ahead. So, you know, what's interesting to me, you know, point that you brought up, like we talk a lot now about how, you know, in the old days, we used to go box by box and do CLI config, and we didn't have something like DNA Center. Um, but now we should be pushing our configs with, with yes, DNA Center, yes. right? We shouldn't be doing yes, that's right. box by box. Yeah. Um, and the fact that we use DNA Center means that the configuration should be pretty well controlled, yes, right? Yes. Um, so what you're saying is, you know, we may be using DNA Center, but you know, maybe somebody's going to the CLI and circumventing DNA yep. Center, and we need to know about that. Like, we push this config with DNAC, but, you know, is it actually the config that's running on the box? Yes, yes, that's right. That's right. Like, uh, so in short, like, uh, because, like, we have, like, number of use cases in such way where, like, uh, customers do to go to the CLI and beat some changes. They wanted to do some changes, and sometimes it's unwantedly. We want to capture everything, and we want to have a single place to show it. Uh, where it's most of the ease of use. Uh, but if you see, uh, there might be a question like, we already doing it using the Cisco Prime and even using the Ansible or Puppet, you can do it already, you can do it. But what's the differentiation which we are right. making with the DNS center? That's the how part, how exactly we are doing it. It's most about the ease of use. It's how easily you can do it and how easily a network engineer can consume it. And with a single click, how easily you can see like whether his network is completely compliant or non-compliant. So that's what we are trying to do with the DNS Center, and that's that's how it, it's planned for. Yeah, yeah. So I want to get into the how in a second, but one question I had, you know, we mentioned um, security, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned quality of service. What are some of the typical things that a customer wants to look at? You know, are there other are there other elements of the config that they want to check, or could it just be anything? Uh, it could be anything, sort of stuff. Like like if you if you take specifically on the DNS Center side. It might be the SDS side. If you if you take it like they might want to look at the list configurations. They want to see like uh, 802.1x configurations. It can be anything. Uh, it can be plenty of things or in a small set of things, because each thing impacts in a different different ways. So as you was explaining, like like a single command screwed up like five RMS. So the same thing can happen with a single stuff yeah. over here also. So what we are doing is like we are not taking it as a single command, rather we are taking it as a whole configuration and doing a compliance check for whole configuration with our intent. So that's the whole idea of the DNS center here. Okay, that makes sense. And I, I know you're gonna show us uh, config compliance in a bit, but one of the questions I, you know, I have is, you know, how does this work? In that example that I gave, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they just went to the device by CLI mm -hmm. and pa literally pasted config into the device, yes. um, which is why they had their problem. Um, but, you know, in this case, we're talking about DNA centers pushing config to our devices mm -hmm. so that, you know, that configuration part is done by DNAC. Um, but now if DNAC wants to validate that the config is in compliance, does it just, um, you know, uh, connect to the device and yes. pull its configuration and do a diff? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. That's how it's do it. Like, like we we'll, uh, we subscribe to the SNMP communities and we look at like what are the changes uh, user is doing like we do it for every five minutes sort of stuff like if a log user logs in and did some changes and we wait for the five minutes timer uh, just to make sure like everything is uh, sleep down then we collect within five minutes and show up the difference showing like okay boss someone logged into the CLI and did these changes do you want to accept these changes or do you want to just ignore them so that's how it is as of today okay so you actually have the option to accept it or, yes. uh, or yeah, like yeah, roll yeah, back yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, th so this is really intent-based networking because you have an intent, like you have a, a vision of what that configuration should yep. be, and then if if it's not matching your intent, then you can say, you know, I, I reject that yes. change and I want to get that device state to where my intention and, is. Yes, yes, and just to add on, uh, especially with the wireless network, mm -hmm. you see, with the wireless, we can automate like from scratch, meaning like customer don't has to touch use at least the AP or the WLC can completely automate using our network profiles, which we pair on the DNS center, which probably I will cover as part of our demo session. So if a customer is using the wireless network completely to onboard from scratch, then we can do like 100% compliant on the board. So this is the first release, which we are doing as part of the 2.1.x. So which, which for the reason which we are doing this uh, podcast. So this is where we have started. So for the wireless, you can do 100% without any issues. For the wired, yes, there are some corner cases, which we are working on it. 
So probably in the future, we'll get hundred uh, percent over there also. That's great. So um, you mentioned also um, that we have a couple of actions we can do. So DNAC may, may detect that um, the configuration is out of compliance. And then um, we can either, you said we, we can either accept that um, configuration or we can reject yes. it. So, so far in the first um, release, so, so yes, it, in the first release, we are going to show as of the diff uh, today, uh, Jeff, like uh, probably in the next couple of releases, okay. we should be having an option to get the accept button also. So just select the device, just click accept. Okay, yep. so all right, gotcha. So that that that's coming up, yeah. and and so how does it know um, in terms of the config that it's doing? Does it keep a, like a um, like rollback, you know, yes. um, uh, so, uh, versions of yeah. the configuration, and that's what it compares. Yeah. Okay. So we do have the internal config archive feature uh, where for whatever the changes the customer do, we go and collect the whole show run and show startup, and we even save the, both the startup and the running configuration just to show the difference between the startup and the running. Just to make sure, like, okay, some customers, as I mentioned, like, if they did the changes, they want to save it, then they want to see the difference between the startup and the running. So we save it for the close to 14 days today. Uh, so there's a plan to improve, increase that one also. But for 14 days, you can absolutely go back into the time in the 14 days at a specific time period and see, like, when exactly this change has been done and what all of those changes, we can easily see them. That's great. So you have a, you have a history of yes. the configuration changes. Yes, and... yes, yes. Oh, great. And the same thing applies for the all the intent-based applications. You know, so I just want to bring one more topic here. Uh, for example, as a DNS center, it's a platform, right? So we have like different apps on it, like application visibility service, uh, stealth was security analytics, or umbrella workflows. So we have different apps. So what we are bringing is like, so we do have some apps already supported as part of the compliance. So we are bringing something called a service-based compliance. So for example, if the customer is using application visibility service, then we should be in a position to see if there is a deviation in the intent for that particular service. So, uh, so are you getting the point? Like we are making sure the DNS center has a single source of the point where a customer has to go and do the changes. It's more like a single source for the automation itself and compliance and assurance. So this is about configuration, yes. right? It, it, it's so, so if I'm using application visibility and to be honest, I've never configured that. So I, I don't know a lot about it, but, but that's, um, enabling us to see what applications yes. are running our yes, network yes, and, yeah. and put policies around yeah. that. So what you're saying is config compliance could make sure that, say, the application visibility service yeah. configuration so, that needs to be on the devices yeah. is, is yeah. there, so, right? Or is 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 the way it is configured the way it should be? Uh, it's 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 more likely. Uh, so so we take it as an intent. So you we take what you configured on the DNS center. And we see like what's there on the device and we compare it. And if there is a deviation, then we show it. So for example, the same application visibility service, if a customer went to the CLA and did some changes specific to that particular feature, then we should be in a position to show in a beautiful way and easiest way for any user to understand, to show like what's the deviation. So for example, it's enabled over here, right. but someone went to the CLA and did some changes and disabled over there. So that's what we should be able to show. It's, it's not like showing the snippet of the CLS because we want to move from the snippets of CLS. Rather, we want to make sure like it's uh, GUI based and easy to understand, easy to consume. So that's what we are trying to achieve here. So I know another issue for some customers is that, uh, you know, maybe they have to adhere to certain standards, right? Like PCI yes. or something like yep. that. And so they have certain um, configuration that they need for, you know, regulatory or legal um, purposes. Yes, yes. Is this a good way to validate that kind of configuration? Uh, to, to say like today we have the APIs available. So to start with, so this is where we have started. So we are exposing the APIs to the customers. So customers can consume these APIs and integrate with their own tools for the PCA or HIPAA compliance for the hospital or the payment card compliance and see if the network is in that particular standard to see whether they are having the PCA standards or HIPAA standards or not. So that's something which is there as part of the APIs, but it's, we great. also bring on a GUI for that one also to give the PCA or HIPAA standards option as part of the DNS center itself. So Pavan, I know that we uh, had configuration compliance in uh, Cisco Prime as well. Um, so is this the same or can you tell me uh, how it's different? Okay. So why don't I just bring my slides here uh, just to show like how exactly this is different and how we are doing it. And probably then I will just go through the demo so that it helps you more to understand like how exactly this is different as compared to the Cisco Prime, right? So when it comes to the compliance, 
as part of the DNS center, we segregate it into the two buckets. One we call it as a network side, and one we call it as a business side of the things. So the network side is actually where we discussed specifically on the cases, like how we can recognize, uh, is there any conflict change on the CLI level, or is there any deviation on the intent, all those things. When it comes to the business things, which also we discussed, it's mostly on the PCA standards or the security advisories or the HIPAA compliance. Yeah. So those are on the business side. So as the DNA center, these are the two pillars when it comes to the compliance, we are going to cover both of them as part of the sections. Now, network compliance, as you can see the network perspective side, we have these features which are shipping as of today, while we are speaking today. Like, uh, I'm not going to run through the each name here, uh, just uh, probably you can see it. It's more self-explanatory, the startup was just running, network profile, software images, fabric, which I will probably cover more in detail in the demo itself, so you get more idea. And one highlight thing which I want to bring up over here, like service-based compliance, which I said, like, it's more about the app-based compliance, which is nothing but the feature-based compliance. So if the customer is using app visibility or umbrella, or still the security analytics, then we should be in a position to do the compliance check even for the feature specific things also. So this is specific to the network. When it comes to the business, the things change. On the business side, you want to see whether your network is having a PCA standard or HIPAA standard, or you want to see like, what's the status of the end of life or end of software maintenance on your network devices and security advisors. So these are the whole things which are available in the mix as part of the APIs view, as part of the complete GUI view. But in the future, we're going to get everything in the GUI. For the business things, we have the APIs available, which I've just mentioned already, the PCA and HIPAA and UL US, we have the APIs. But for the network, it's completely on the GUI. So let me just stop here. Uh, let me see if you have any further questions or I can just directly jump into the demo. Yeah, so no, this is great. And so EOL, EOS would be, you know, if we have devices in our network that are end of life, we need to get rid of them. We want to sort of yeah, audit yeah. that and see, you know, do we have devices that, that are going to need to be replaced, yeah, yeah. right? Okay. Okay. And the rest, I think, are pretty self-explanatory. Yeah, let's see the yeah. demo. Let me just directly jump into the demo. Okay, this is my DNS center. I'm pretty sure like everyone by now will be familiar with the DNS center. So I'm not going to go in detail about each and everything, right? Uh, so let me just click on the inventory. So which takes me to this page where I have a single view here, which gives me the details about like, what are the network devices and what's the status, whether they compliant or non-compliant and not available. So not available is the case where we don't have the CLA configurations or uh, we are doing it at the control level specifically for the APs. So let me just select one of the devices here, Jeff. So I'm just selecting a CAT 9300 here. I just want to cover one use case one at a time. So I have something called a startup versus running, which you are specifically saying like, okay, how we are recognizing the CLA changes and how we are saving it. So this is how we are doing it. So we have a beautiful graph over here, which has the access with the number of lines, the CLI lines and the y-axis with the dates of 14 days of data. And this red line is nothing but the running config is out of sync with the startup config. And in sync is nothing but running config is in sync with the startup configuration. In short, like someone logged into the CLI and did a write mem, then also we save the configuration and we show it here. If someone logged into the CLI and they forgot to do the write mem, because that's one, one of the important points, right? If they, if they did some critical changes, and they forgot to do the right memory for the God's sake, if it goes for the reboot, then obviously things will screw up. So in order to save those things, yeah. we have this out of sync option just to show the customer like, hey, okay, hey, someone logged into the CLA and did some changes and you forgot to do the uh, right memory. So that's what we are showing here. And here we are just highlighting the difference and showing exactly what's the difference between the startup and the running at that particular date and time. For example, I have a cursor here and I've selected this particular line, and it even shows me like the changes made since its previous version, number of lines added, removed, modified. So that's what we are showing here. And if you want to drill down and see, for example, there are like so many changes in a particular day instant, then we do have this zoom in feature where a user can just zoom in and just drill down further and see like what are all those changes. Let me just click on one of them. Okay, so someone did some network changes. While, while you're doing this, yep. 
while you're doing this, just an observation, I, I think the other useful thing about this graph is, you know, let's say somebody made significant configuration changes, like they pushed SDA fabric or something. Mm -hmm. You're going to notice on this graph, right? Because you'll see a big jump in the number of lines. Yes. And it's, it's really easy to see, yes. which, you know, that's something you want to keep track of. Yes, yes, yes. That's right. That's right. So, for example, someone added a BGP configuration here, so which is very important, and they forgot to do the right map. So that's what we are showing here. So in startup, there is no BGP, but yeah. someone logged into the CLA and did some changes. It might be important. It might not be now. So we are just giving the option to customer to show like, okay, this is what someone has added. So this helps them to understand like what are all changes have happened in the past 14 days of the database, but what we have for all the devices. We save it for the switches, routers. And I have to say, uh, Pavan, Sorry, uh, I was just going to say that the um, the visualization here is a lot better than a standard diff where you yes. have like the pluses and the minuses. Like you're actually showing on the left where that line, where that block of configuration would be inserted if it existed in that config. It's just a lot easier to look at yep. and, and see quickly like what's going on. So, so that's great. Yeah. And also we are just only showing the snippet of the changes. We are not showing like the entire configuration like so, for example, if you see here, the actual lines are 472, but we are only showing the snippet of where the changes have been happened. So that's also one good thing uh, in order to identify your changes easily and recognize like when and what changes have been happened. So this is one thing. Now, let me just take you to one more setup where I have. I just want to specifically cover on the wireless side because wireless is one of the interesting topics for the most of the customers and show like how it deviates and how it helps in the complex section also. I do have a wireless and controller uh, over here. Let me just click on non-compliant. As I mentioned, if a customer is using the DNS center in order to bring up his whole network, then he's going to use the network profiles for sure. Network profiles in a way, they automate easily your net wireless network devices, either the wireless and controllers or APs with the zero touch. You have to just configure SSIDs, give the names and authentication parameters, everything. And DNS Center should be in a position to do all the changes for you. So that's what we are going to do here. So for example, on the network profiles, if I just click on it, someone logged into the CLI or GUI of this particular wireless LAN controller. And for this particular WLAN, there is a status change. For example, if you can see the DNAC value is enabled and the device value is disabled. So in short, like it's very easy for the customers to see like what are the changes have happened. Uh, you go to the point of what I'm trying to uh, explain here. So it's very easy for them to just pinpoint rather than showing the snippets. Yes, we are also showing for the parity, but we are showing in a more graphical way for ease of use for the customers. So question for you on that. What does DNAC value enable actually mean? I'm not quite following what that means. Okay, so the DNAC value enabled in the sense like this SSID particularly, this has been configured on the DNS center and it's been enabled on the DNS center and configured, pushed the profile to the particular wireless LAN controller. So it's enabled here. But someone so, went to the device and they just disabled this WLAN. So that's what we are showing here. So WLAN, the attribute, the admin status changed, meaning like the admin status has been changed from enable to disable. Yeah. So what we would expect is to see enable enable. Uh, under yes. That? Meaning, if if customer did, okay. uh, meaning if if he haven't did any changes, then you won't be seeing this alert a lot. Meaning like you shouldn't be seeing it at all because the intent is to have it enable, but someone logged in to the CLI or WebUI and disabled it. So if it's if it's if if he wants to just push it back, then you can just go back and just provision this profile again, then this alert will be gone. So simple way, just go to the profile and just push it back to the wireless and controller, then you won't be seeing this alert again. So easy way to even uh, push or, or just uh, make sure like you, you suppress this complaints alert also. So that's now one question I had. You uh, showed a screen, this screen right here, uh, real quick. I wanted to know. So you can also check uh, not just the configuration, and we mentioned you know things like uh, uh, EOS, EOL, but you're also um, showing here whether we're on the software image yes. that we expect to be uh, running for that particular device. Yes, yes. So even for the software images, so it's all coming from the golden image. So if you are using the software image management workflow, which we have. 
then for sure you have to configure the golden image so golden image is nothing but the image which you want to run in a particular site or a particular access layer or a distribution layer based on either your research or cisco recommendation which you thought like okay this is my uh, golden software which i want to run on this particular layer or particular site so that's what we are showing here so this for example 16.2.4 is my golden image but the device is running on 17.3.1 so so my golden image is lower, but this is what I want to intend to be. So that's what I have configured, but it's it, it's it's different from the what's running on the device. So that's what we are showing here. So if the customer wants to um, just correct this one, then he has to just go ahead and upgrade his network device to 16.12.4 in short. So that helps the customer to understand in a single view, in a single dashboard, the compliance summary page over here. He can say like, what are the profiles? What's the software image and even Critical security advisors this is not available for the wireless as of today, but on the wired, you should be able to see this one also. The security advisor is. Oh, that's great. So this one page is a great view of all the information you need on the compliance yeah. of that device. Also, you can run the compliance on yeah. demand specific to the device. For example, we have this option called as run compliance. You can just run it on the device, or if you want to do it for the bulk of the devices at a time, then you can just select the devices which you are interested in, go to actions, compliance, and run compliance. This will also trigger the compliance. This is for the on-demand, but for whatever the changes which customer is doing, uh, we do it by default, meaning he don't have to worry. For, for any CLA changes, going to the CLA and doing some changes, we should be identified, as I mentioned, within five minutes, we should be able to show them. That's available as of today. And also we can even do it for the fabric application visibility, as I mentioned, the fabric, the customer is doing some fabric changes, then we should be in a position to show if there is a deviation from the intent, like what's there on the DNS center, what's there on the device, if it's a different, then we should be in a position to show them like, okay, this is the difference between what's there on the DNS center and what's there on the device also that's available. So this is how it is uh, as a dashboard. But as I mentioned, like we are going to add more number of dashlets here. So in the future, we'll be seeing like a lot more dashlets here including uh, whatever we've discussed, like the ULES and the P-certs, sorry, not the P-certs, the PCI or the HIPAA compliance, everything should be available here also. So Pavan, uh, you know, I'm an old CLI guy and, uh, you know, I love CLI and that's how I've done stuff for years. But to be honest, there were always things that were just really difficult to do, uh, you know, using traditional methods. And I think, you know, what you've shown me is better than, you know, even some of the other, uh, you know, automation tools that are out there because uh, it's hard to do things like figuring out what devices on your network are EOL or whether they're uh, running the right image or whether there's some, some P-certs yeah. out there on that device. Yeah. So this looks like it would make the life of a network yes. engineer a lot easier. Yeah. So that's the whole point. Like we want to make sure like they have very ease of use and easy to understand. That's the main uh, agenda for the DNS and roles. And configuration compliance is available in which DNA center release? Uh, it's uh, 2.1.x. Which is which we achieved like two dot one yeah, the last one week back yeah fantastic well thank you again uh, Pavan for joining me on coffee with TMEs thank I you. actually didn't drink very much coffee but you didn't drink yeah. any but uh, it was a good chat yeah. and I learned quite a few things about uh, configuration compliance Same so here. I know it's late there so uh, have a good you night too. and uh, thank you Pavan for your time thank you thank you Jeff thank you so much.